the office of the President of the United States of America is the highest in the land and an honor to hold. It is also of international importance as the President is a world leader and his decisions can affect us all. to decide the Democratic nominee for the 2008 U.S. presidential election was by anyone's standards a stirring moment in history. Although almost unimaginable only a few short years ago, it seemed likely that for the first time ever, the nominee would be a woman, and a woman with impeccable political credentials. Not only did Hillary Clinton have that famous surname to bolster her chances, she also had the political smarts and experience to do the job. But that dream ride to the White House was not to be, because her opposing candidate for the Democratic nomination was another one for the history books, the young national senator for the state of Illinois, Barack Obama. It's history both ways. I mean, you got the first woman who could potentially be the president of the United States, and you have the first African-American male who could be the president of the United States. So either way, we're looking at history. It soon became apparent to observers across the globe that while in any other year Clinton would have had the nomination sewn up, she had the misfortune to face a politician who was truly one out of the box. Are you uncomfortable in the role of chastising someone's idealism? Is, is, is that an, an uncomfortable place no, for you to be? No, I really admire that. I think that, uh, you know, the, the ability to inspire and, and certainly get people involved that we've seen from Senator Obama is wonderful. Uh, and I believe that it's important, though, that we remember uh, the job has to be just the daily getting up and doing it. And I try to mix both of those because, obviously, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't care deeply about changing our country and knowing that we could do better. And after a protracted and sometimes bitter battle between these two standout candidates in mid-2008, Clinton stepped aside and resolved to help her erstwhile opponent in his greatest endeavor, to become President of the United States. I am running to tell the corporate lobbyists that their days of setting the agenda in Washington are over. They have not funded my campaign. They will not work in my White House. And they will not drown out the voices of the American people when I'm president of the United States of America. Barack Obama has a mixed ethnic background, but his dark skin means he has to be regarded as America's first genuine black presidential candidate. So how did he get to this exalted position? Phrases like meteoric rise trip off the tongue when you begin to consider this 47-year-old who only became a national senator in 2005. But in three short years, he has made an indelible impression. Is he the one? South Carolina, I do believe he's the one to bring us the audacity of hope. Barack Obama! Barack Obama! It's Obama time! It's Obama time! Barack Hussein Obama was born on the 4th of August, 1961, in Honolulu, Hawaii. His father, also named Barack, was a Kenyan of the Lua tribe, born in Alago, near Lake Victoria. His mother was Ann Dunham, a white woman from Wichita, who had moved to Hawaii with her parents in 1959. She and Barack Sr. met while studying at the University of Hawaii where he was the institution's first African student. Mixed racial marriages were still a rarity in the early 60s, and unfortunately, this one wasn't to last. 
By the time he was two years old, Barack's parents had gone their own separate ways. He was to meet his father just once more, when Barack Sr. came to Hawaii for a month-long visit in the early 70s. Before that, his mother took the six-year-old to live in Indonesia, where she married again. Their second husband was another student from the University of Hawaii, Lolo Soatoro, who had proposed to her before returning to Indonesia. I think Barack Obama's great strength for Democratic voters is his story, which he's emphasized. Um, it's an uh, inspirational story. It's a story of a great merit, of somebody who has um, overcome uh, enormous personal obstacles and has arisen as a result of his uh, talent, skills, energy, and diligence. Obama's life in Indonesia was idyllic for a young boy. And in 1970, his mother presented him with a half-sister, Maya. But Anne was keen for her son to experience an American education, and so sent him back to Hawaii to live with his grandparents, known as Gramps and Tut, when he was just 10 years old. In some ways, it's a story similar to Bill Clinton's. Um, it's raised by, a, in some ways, with a single mother and um, has a broken family. Um, and yet uh, finds himself um, uh, rising uh, to uh, these positions all on his own. Sadly, Anne's second marriage failed too, and she returned with Maya to Hawaii to join her son and study for her master's degree in anthropology. As Obama's teen years progressed, he began to question his identity more and more. From 1971 to 1979, he was enrolled in the prestigious Punahou Academy, where he excelled both in his studies and at basketball, but was conscious of being one of the few black faces on campus. Learning all he could about black history, the civil rights movement, and political struggle left him confused and torn between his loyalty to the three white faces who had raised him and his growing awareness of what it meant to be black in America. His grades began to slip, and he experimented with drugs. But he still did well enough in his studies to get a place at the small but well-regarded Occidental College in Los Angeles, transferring after his sophomore year to the much larger Columbia University in New York, the alma mater of such political heavyweights as Boutrous Boutrous Ghali and Madeleine Albright and President Eisenhower. After graduating with a BA in political science in 1983, Obama moved to Chicago, and it was here his interest and talent for activism and grassroots politics really took hold. Working as a community organizer in the most disadvantaged areas of Chicago, he developed his skills and resources and accomplished some positive reforms, such as establishing a job training program and a tenants' rights organization in the significantly disadvantaged suburb Altgill Gardens. It was also during this period that he first encountered Reverend Jeremiah Wright, a firebrand preacher whose rousing sermons prompted a religious epiphany in the formerly reticent Obama. It was an association that meant a great deal to Obama, but one that was to cause him grief in the years to come. Mostly, though, Obama's experience in Chicago taught him that if he was to accomplish anything really meaningful and lasting, he needed more skills. He needed the legal know-how to get things done. And in 1988, he applied for and was accepted into Harvard Law School. But before he was ready to take his place in those hallowed halls, there was one more trip he needed to take. I am so proud to come back home and see all since being informed by a long-distance phone call of his father's death in a car accident in 1982, Obama had continued to struggle with questions of self-identity and understanding his roots. He thought a five-week visit to his father's homeland might give him some answers. While in Kenya, he learned much about who his father really was, met his half-brothers and sisters, and many more members of his vast extended family and began to understand his own complicated position as one who had grown up with the sort of privileges and opportunities most of his relations could only dream about. Whenever I see a young boy, five or six or seven or eight or ten, 
I think about my father. Uh, and I think about the journey that he traveled. So many miles and such a great distance. Uh, and I think about those young boys and I think there's no reason why they can't do the same. He returned to the U.S. invigorated and inspired. Entering Harvard in late 1988, he hit the ground running. By the end of his first year, he was an editor of the Law Review, and a year later, he was elected as the first black president of the Harvard Law Review, an achievement so impressive, he was even offered an advance to write a book about race relations. Dreams from My Father was eventually published in mid-1995, but didn't become a bestseller until it was reissued in 2004. In 2006, he produced another bestseller, The Audacity of Hope, the title of which came from one of Reverend Wright's sermons. Before that, though, he graduated magna cum laude from Harvard, worked as a lawyer, received a fellowship at the University of Chicago, where he taught constitutional law for 12 years and sat on a number of boards. His personal life was falling into place. In October 1992, he married lawyer Michelle Robinson. In The Audacity of Hope, Obama says of his wife, if I ever had to run against her for public office, she would beat me without much difficulty. And he's not the only one who thinks so. Michelle is widely regarded as an impressive and formidable talent in her own right. And Obama has publicly credited her along with his mother, who died of ovarian cancer in 1995, and his college friend Regina as being among the many women who helped enlighten him about gender politics. Obama and Michelle's first daughter, Malia, was born in 1998, with sister Natasha following three years later. Obama was also beginning to be noticed publicly. In 1992, he directed the Illinois Project Vote, which managed to register 150,000 previously unregistered African-American voters. This initiative alone led to him being named on a list of 40 under 40 powers to be. It was becoming clearer and clearer that Obama's real future lay in politics. But first, he had to get a name for himself. He's black. That's all I know about him. I just uh, don't know anything about him. I don't know. I haven't really decided. He seems like a nice guy, but I haven't quite decided. Well, the, uh, that's why we have campaigns. That's why we're here today, so that people get a chance to get to know me. In 1996, Obama was elected to the Illinois State Senate. He was subsequently re-elected in 1998 and 2002, using his time in the Senate to negotiate welfare reform while focusing on health care and other issues facing people on low incomes. During this period, he suffered the first major setback of his political career to date, when he ran for the U.S. House of Representatives in 2000, but was outvoted by two to one. Getting back on the horse, Obama took the loss in his stride and tried to learn all he could from the experience. A couple of years later, he was ready for the next step and announced his intention to run for the U.S. Senate. After gaining the Democratic nomination, he was due to face off against a formidable opponent, Jack Ryan, the Republican primary winner. But when less than savory details were released about Ryan's divorce from Hollywood actor Jerry Ryan, he was forced to withdraw from the race. Uh, I think that uh, it should be done in conjunction with uh, those uh, congressional committees that have oversight uh, so that it is not uh, simply an internal matter. On the 27th of July, 2004, the little-known state senator from Illinois found himself chosen to deliver the keynote address at the Democratic National Convention held in Boston, Massachusetts. I owe a debt to all of those who came before me and that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. 
Obama was there to support John Kerry's bid for the presidency in the forthcoming election. America, tonight, if you feel the same energy that I do, if you feel the same urgency that I do, if you feel the same passion that I do, if you feel the same hopefulness that I do, if we do what we must do, then I have no doubt that all across the country, from Florida to Oregon, from Washington to Maine, the people will rise up in November and John Kerry will be sworn in as president and John Edwards will be sworn in as vice president and this country will reclaim its promise and out of this long political darkness, a brighter day will come. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. But his rapturous reception brought the spotlight firmly down on his own head. From this moment on, the buzz began to grow that perhaps the self-described skinny kid with a funny name who believes that America has a place for him too could actually find that place in the most exalted office in the land, the White House. And I think what Barack represents is hope for anybody. It doesn't matter what color you are or what creed. It's hope. You know, if you can dream, you can do it. You know, and I think that's why he's so refreshing. But Obama's first challenge was the National Senate. Sworn in on the 4th of January 2005, Obama quickly surrounded himself with an impressive team of political advisors. Only the fifth African-American senator in U.S. history, Obama was determined to make his presence and allegiances felt. He took assignments on committees focusing on his primary concerns, health, education, labor and pensions, and homeland security. But despite being ranked the most liberal senator by the National Journal in 2007, he would regularly endorse bipartisan issues. Co-sponsoring an Immigration Reform Act introduced by his future Republican opponent, John McCain, and co-introducing an expansion of an existing initiative to dismantle weapons of mass destruction. Most notably, he was particularly vocal about his opposition to the war in Iraq, in 2007, he introduced the Iraq War De-Escalation Act, stipulating the capping of troop levels, the commencement of phased redeployment, and significantly, the removal of all combat brigades from Iraq by April 2008. That may have been wishful thinking. Why have we spent $350 billion in Iraq? But Obama had long been aware that taking a firm stance on issues close to his heart would help voters see him as strong and principled, a potential leader. In February 2007, he made the announcement his supporters had been waiting to hear. To announce my candidacy for president of the United States of America. I still believe that America is the last best hope on earth. We just have to show the world why this is so. This president may occupy the White House, but for the last six years, the position of leader of the free world has remained open. And it is time to fill that role once more. For Democrats, the only downside to Obama announcing his candidacy was that Hillary Clinton, one of the party's strongest candidates in years, had also thrown her hat into the ring. It's called a race. It's January. The end of the race is in November. Somebody could trip and fall in October and September. Anything could happen. We'll see. I think it's too important. I think too much damage has been done in the past eight years in this country. So I don't think I want to make any quick decision. I want to look the person in the eye. I want to hear what they have to say. I don't want them to just be some warm, fuzzy guy or woman who uh, is clever you know, in January. It's only January. The battle for the Democratic nomination would prove to be protracted and arduous, with the two candidates engaging in a fierce game of one-upmanship. Events commemorating the 42nd anniversary of the historic civil rights marches in Selma, Alabama, gave both Clinton and Obama an opportunity to talk about race relations, but also to put their own case to the electorate. The Voting Rights Act gave more Americans from every corner of our nation the chance to live out their dreams. And it is the gift that keeps on giving. Today, it is giving Senator Obama the chance to run for President of the United States.
And by its logic and spirit, it is giving the same chance to Governor Bill Richardson, a Hispanic. And yes, it is giving me that chance to. Throughout the campaign, Obama was careful not to overplay the race card. But in Selma, it was hard to ignore. So don't tell me I don't have a claim on Selma, Alabama. Don't tell me I'm not coming home when I come to Selma, Alabama. I'm here because somebody must for our free. I'm here because y'all sacrificed for me. I stand on the shoulders of Jack. The attention paid to the struggle between Obama and Clinton, however, often meant that actual policies and issues became sidelined. But Obama tried to stick to his core message and emphasized again and again his three core issues, ending the war in Iraq, increasing energy independence and providing universal health care. And as things began to swing Obama's way, Clinton's speeches reflected her awareness of what was coming. I know that Senator Obama will be a good friend to Israel. While Obama's speeches sounded more and more presidential. I will do everything in my power to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Everything in my power to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Everything. Israel's security is sacrosanct. It is non-negotiable. The Palestinians need a state. The Palestinians need a state that is contiguous and cohesive, and that allows them to prosper. But any agreement with the Palestinian people must preserve Israel's identity as a Jewish state with secure, recognized, defensible borders. And Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel, and it must remain undivided. And eventually, his persistence paid off. With an unbeatable number of superdelegates pledging their support for the Obama camp, on the 7th of June, 2008, Hillary Clinton finally conceded the race and called for her supporters to get behind the new Democratic nominee. The way to continue our fight now to accomplish the goals for which we stand is to take our energy, our passion, our strength, and do all we can to help elect Barack Obama, the next president of the United States. seized the day in typically rousing style. This was the moment when the rise of the ocean began to slow and our planet began to heal. This was the moment when we ended a war and secured our nation and restored our image as the last best hope on earth. With the Democratic nomination under his belt, it was time to face his next opponent, the Republican presidential nominee, Arizona State Senator John McCain. Despite having worked together on that Immigration Reform Act, the two men couldn't be more different. Born in 1936, McCain is 25 years older than Obama and a retired Navy captain. Much of his initial appeal to voters lay in his impressive military record, which included capture and prolonged torture in Vietnam in 1967. Highly decorated, his medals include the famed Purple Heart. On the downside, he's been seen as a mere continuation of his predecessor. You'll hear from my opponent's campaign in every speech, in every interview, every press release, that I'm running for President Bush's third term. You'll hear, you'll hear every policy of the president is described as the Bush-McCain policy. Whether Barack Obama can go all the way is yet to be seen. 
But whatever happens in November 2008, what cannot be refuted is that his career to date has been one for the history books. For such a comparatively young and inexperienced politician, his campaign strategies have been extraordinarily well thought out and executed. But that's not to say there haven't been missteps. One of the most significant concerned his long-term pastor and friend, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright. We bombed Hiroshima, we bombed Nagasaki, and we nuked far more than the thousands in New York and the Pentagon, and we never batted an eye. Wright's sermons had always been passionate and outspoken. But by March 2008, it was clear that Obama's association with the outspoken cleric was harming his reputation, and he regretfully disassociated himself from the church. As imperfect as he may be, he has been like family to me. He strengthens my faith, officiated my wedding, and baptized my children. Not once in my conversations with him have I heard him talk about any ethnic group in derogatory terms or treat whites with whom he interacted with anything but courtesy and respect. He contains within him the contradictions, the good and the bad, of the community that he has served diligently for so many years. Then there was the link to Scarlett Johansson when talk began to spread of an email relationship between the Hollywood actress and the presidential candidate. I have been a supporter of surrogate of the Obama campaign for some time now, and you know I think I was originally uh, interested and, and attracted to Barack Obama because of his opposition to the war in Iraq, and I just think that he has amazing policies, and I think that he really is, is um, leading the, this incredible, inspiring movement for change, and I want to be a part of it. Perhaps mindful of the trouble previous Democratic presidents had faced due to their associations with attractive younger women, Obama was swift to downplay the connection, telling reporters she didn't even have his personal email address. He said Johansson had sent an email to his assistant, Reggie Love, and he'd merely sent her a thank you note. Perhaps Johansson should have followed the lead of George Clooney, one of the few celebrities experienced enough to know that his support could be a double-edged sword. Oh, I'm a big Obama guy. I've been an Obama guy from the very beginning. I, but, you know, throwing your weight can often be, uh, you know, the elephant in the room if you're not careful. So, I, you know, my father ran for Congress and I didn't campaign for him because you can actually hurt him. Uh, so you, you know, the, the idea is to try and support as much as you can and not get in the way. Of greater concern to the Obama camp was the fallout he faced in April 2008 following his now infamous bitter speech when he talked about small towns in the Midwest becoming bitter because they'd been let down by successive administrations. Obama's comments led to accusations of elitism and being out of touch, not only from his Republican opponents, but from others in his own party, including Hillary Clinton. Senator Obama's remarks are elitist and they're out of touch. But he weathered the storm, refusing to recant, but insisting that his remarks were merely badly phrased. Something that everybody knows is true. When you're bitter, you, you turn to what you can count on. So people, you know, they're, they vote about guns or they take comfort from their faith. Since then, his battle for the presidency has been more about policy and issues, as he and McCain strive to position themselves as the man most capable to do the job. Not surprisingly, the Republicans seized upon Obama's inexperience. But one of Obama's most well-known supporters was quick to defend the candidate. Barack Obama does not have the experience to be president of the United States. And I can prove that. Remember, he wasn't experienced enough to vote to authorize the invasion of Iraq. Instead, even then he voted against the war he said would lead to an occupation of undetermined length and undetermined costs and undetermined consequences. 
He just didn't get it. Obama still faces obstacles, not the least of which is that exotic name. And while in his home country, Obama is even now struggling to convince his compatriots in some areas that his name and background do not reveal a secret Muslim past. On the world stage, his popularity is remarkable, with Muslims and non-Muslims alike. I'm bored of white men in America. You want a black president? Yes. <laughs> He, among all the candidates, shows the great empathy for the world outside of America and shows the greatest uh, sincerity to apologize for America's mistakes. I think because he is a, I'll say a multicultural person, but he uh, is a voice that we haven't heard in a long time, a voice that we trust, a voice that brings us all together, that is black, white, Asian, uh, Indian, whatever. In July 2008, he made a brief tour overseas, first visiting the Middle East. His trip coincided with an attack by an Arab in which 24 Israelis were injured just down the road from Obama's hotel. And it's just one more reminder of why we have to work diligently, urgently, and in a unified way to defeat terrorism. There are no excuses. And I am absolutely committed to working with the Israeli government to make sure that these kinds of occurrences do not happen. And my thoughts and prayers go out to the families uh, that uh, have suffered as a consequence of today's vicious attacks. Thank you, everybody. Obama then headed to Europe, where he met with heads of state in Germany, France, and Britain. And he overcame the potential embarrassment of not being allowed to speak in front of the Brandenburg Gate, as President Kennedy so famously did in 1963, by drawing over 200,000 people to his second choice venue, the Victory Column in Tiergarten Park. No one welcomes war. I recognize the enormous difficulties in Afghanistan. But my country and yours have a stake in seeing that NATO's first mission beyond Europe's borders is a success. For the people of Afghanistan and for our shared security, the work must be done. America can't do this alone. The Afghan people need our troops and your troops, our support and your support, to defeat the Taliban and al-Qaeda, to develop their economy, and to help them rebuild their nation. We have too much at stake to turn back now. Yes, there have been differences between America and Europe. No doubt there will be differences in the future. But the burdens of global citizenship continue to bind us together. A change of leadership in Washington will not lift this burden. In this new century, Americans and Europeans alike will be required to do more, not less. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way, the one way, to protect our common security and advance our common humanity. History shows that popularity overseas certainly doesn't equate to a win at home, and Obama's standing in the polls lost points following his European tour, amongst accusations of flip-flopping on policies and being little more than a shallow celebrity. The latter was a criticism leveled by the McCain camp in an advertisement juxtaposing Obama with Paris Hilton and Britney Spears. The Obama camp played it cool, but displaying a hitherto unsuspected sense of humor Hilton herself fired back, making her own presidential ad, which promised compromise in her energy policy and an intention to paint the White House pink. I don't have any comments. I think the video speaks for itself. So people can just go to funnierdie.com and check it out for themselves. Only I'm not from the olden days, and I'm not promising change like that other guy. I'm just hot. That wrinkly white hair guy used me in his campaign ad, which I guess means I'm running for president. So thanks for the endorsement, white haired dude. And I want America to know that I'm like totally ready to leave. Fortunately, Obama had some heavier weights on his side. We need change. We intend to have change. He also has an uncommon capacity.
capacity to appeal to the better angels of our nature. Knock down all of these old barriers that people thought existed with respect to the opportunities that are available for uh, African Americans, and my congratulations to him. Even a professional curmudgeon like Gore Vidal gave him the thumbs up, although it was something of a backhanded compliment. How could he measure himself? What are the measuring rods? What will he do about the court? Who is going to appoint to the Supreme Court or the other? Don't you have to ask who he is, in a way? Don't you have to ask, is he a bright man? Is he a capable Well, man? apparently he is. You read his speech on race. Yes, I, well, I listened to it. It's quite a remarkable piece. I've spent my life listening to remarkable pieces coming from Winston Churchill and poor Jack Kennedy. I'm not, I'm not fetched by them. But are you gloomy about an Obama presidency? Don't see why I should be. Well, you're gloomy about a lot else. Well, he can't be worse than what we've got. But Obama also showed the ability to attract grassroots support. Now, I think he's going to be a very positive candidate, and I think it's time for change, and I think he represents change. And I hope that everything that he's um, saying, that he stands by it, and look forward to the first black president. And not just among African Americans. Thank you so much. People are supporting him in Iowa. People supported him in Iowa. You know, we saw the news. There were very, very little faces that looked like mine. So I don't think that race is playing a role in this. And of course, this being America, there are always plenty of celebrities to count on. A new, fresh, new candidate. And I was really uh, impressed by the fact that uh, he was not taking any money from uh, <coughs> special interest groups. It's like it's all individual donors. I thought that was, that was the key thing. It wasn't actually the, the blackness, but, you know, that didn't hurt. <laughs> Obama. I'm excited about uh, Senator Obama. I... Uh, I'm excited about just the desire for seeing change. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about, ecstatic about just how many Americans that are on the same page as me. I just think he's just a, a, a perfect choice for the, the future of, of America. I spent a lot of time outside of the the country and i just think the things that that he he stands for and just the, the just his background his, his family I, I truly appreciate uh who he is and i think he'd be an absolutely wonderful president of the united states they have to be sexy and um i'd prefer if they were a man or a woman but that's it what else do you need in a president and the ability to push a button and that's it those are three things and you're good. And if your name's Barack Obama, that's the best. I'll only say that we have a hero in the making back in the United States today because we have a new uh, candidate for president of the United States, Barack Obama, who I think for all of us that have dreams and hope uh, is a hero. But for all the big names and familiar faces lining up to barrack for Barack, by August 2008, there was only one name voters were interested in hearing about, the name of the person Obama had selected as his running mate. On the 23rd of August, he took the novel step of releasing the scoop to his most dedicated followers first via a text message to their mobile phones. He followed that with a public announcement in Springfield. A man with a distinguished record, a man with fundamental decency, and that man is Joe Biden. The career politician brought a wealth of experience to the campaign, plus personal qualities that complemented Obama's. Compared to the young, black, inexperienced Obama, the 65-year-old Biden brought maturity, whiteness, and 30 years of experience in the Senate. A dyed-in-the-wool Catholic, he had great appeal to the blue-collar, middle-class, erstwhile Hillary Clinton supporters. He was known for being a plain speaker and a solid friend of the working class. And surprisingly, given his staunch Catholicism, he was also pro-choice on the issue of abortion. 
There were, however, a few misgivings about the six-term senator, namely his tendency to speak out of turn on occasions. In fact, as soon as he was named as Obama's running mate, the McCain camp swiftly pounced on comments he'd made earlier in the race about Obama not being ready to be president, allegations he wittingly countered by referring to McCain's campaign-damaging admission that he didn't know how many houses he and his wife owned. You talk about how much you're worried about being able to pay the bills. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's not a worry John McCain has to worry about. It's a pretty hard experience. He'll have to figure out which of the seven kitchen tables to sit at. I'm on the evening of Monday, the 25th of August, 2008, the Democratic Party began its national convention. Obama's wife, Michelle, was among the early speakers. Her address was carefully constructed to banish any lingering worries among the electorate that her husband was not just like them. She emphasized his ordinary family life and his unwavering and unquestionable patriotism. With profound gratitude, and great humility, I accept your nomination for presidency of the United States. But if a week is a long time in politics, three months might as well be a millennium. Obama was riding high after the Democratic convention, but the following week it was the Republicans' turn to bask in the spotlight. In perhaps the most headline-grabbing move of McCain's entire campaign, on the 29th of August, he picked Sarah Palin as his running mate. The little-known and largely inexperienced governor of Alaska immediately caused a stir, becoming the focus of intense media and public interest. The next vice president of the United States, Sarah Palin. Her nomination was formally announced at the Republican convention ensuring that the event, which was downsized as the government responded to the threats posed by Hurricane Gustav, didn't lose momentum for the party. In late September and early October, McCain and Obama went head-to-head -head in three presidential debates, focusing on issues such as the economy and foreign policy. CBS polls after the debates labeled Obama as the clear winner on all three occasions, while McCain was criticized for being aggressive and erratic, as well as downright rude for refusing to look his opponent in the eye. Obama, by contrast, remained even-tempered, polite, and stuck to his message. And the main message, it was becoming increasingly clear, was the economy. As October wore on and the financial markets around the world began to crash, it was Obama's policies that seemed to resonate. Having suffered a slip in the polls in September, he now began to pull ahead. But despite being in the final throes of a hard-fought campaign, both candidates still found time for a little levity when they attended the 63rd annual Alfred E. Smith Memorial Foundation dinner a charity event organized for the benefit of children in need. Now, recently, one of John's uh, top advisors told the Daily News that if we keep talking about the economy, uh, McCain's going to lose. So tonight, I'd like to talk about the economy. <laughs> McCain countered with a jibe, referring to the one character who was threatening to derail Obama's winning trajectory, Samuel Joe Wurzelbacher, otherwise known as Joe the Plumber. Events are moving fast in my campaign. And yes, it's true that this morning I've dismissed my entire team of senior advisors. All of their positions will now be held by a man named Joe the Plumber. Wurzelbacher was the working man who had approached Obama while he was on the campaign trail in Ohio and complained that Obama's tax policy would negatively affect his business expansion plans. In the third presidential debate, McCain repeatedly referred to Joe the Plumber, holding him up as some kind of symbolic everyman. Joe the Plumber's out there. But Obama had his own working class heroes prepared to rock the vote. In mid-October, Bruce Springsteen and Billy Joel joined forces to headline a fundraising concert for Obama in the swing state of Pennsylvania. 
As November the 4th edged ever nearer, Obama's lead in the polls held steady, although there were rumblings about the so-called Bradley effect. This referred to Tom Bradley, the African-American politician who ran for governor of California in 1982 and lost, despite being ahead in the polls. It was believed that some voters may have not named their true preference in polling for fear of being seen as racist. On a personal front, Obama had more pressing worries. The week before the election, he suspended his campaign to make a last visit to Hawaii to see his widowed grandmother, who was gravely ill. The 86-year-old Madeline Dunham, known affectionately as Toot, died of cancer on November the 2nd. It was an emotional time for Obama, who was on the cusp of the greatest achievement of his political career. But he held it together and told a campaign rally in North Carolina that his beloved grandmother was at peace. Uh, some of you heard that my grandmother, uh, who helped raise me, passed away uh, early this morning. And uh, look, she, she, she has gone home. And she died peacefully in her sleep uh, with my sister at her side. And so, there's great joy as well as tears. I'm not going to talk about it too long because it's hard a little to talk about. On November the 4th, 2008, Obama and his wife Michelle cast their ballots at a polling place in their hometown of Chicago. Across the nation, millions of Americans queued, sometimes for hours, to cast their own votes. Among them, were an unprecedented number of first-time voters who had been galvanized by Obama's message of hope and renewal. The results came in, and a sea of blue spread over the electoral map. Only the Deep South remained impregnably Republican. Before the evening was out, Obama had captured the required 270 electoral college votes and was indisputably the victor. McCain conceded in a dignified and gracious speech, calling Obama my president. The 72-year-old Arizona senator urged all Americans, including his supporters, to rally behind Obama, saying he planned to help the new president-elect tackle the myriad issues the country faced. I urge all Americans who supported me to join me in not just congratulating him, but offering our next president our goodwill and earnest effort to find ways to come together, to find the necessary compromises to bridge our differences and help restore our prosperity, defend our security in a dangerous world, and leave our children and grandchildren a stronger, better country than we inherited. Whatever our differences, we are fellow Americans. Then the new first family elect took to the stage at Chicago's Grant Park in front of 75,000 delirious supporters. The president-elect, his wife, and two young daughters were a potent symbol of the force for change that had swept through the political establishment. It's been a long time coming. But tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, Change has come to America. And all those watching tonight from beyond our shores, from parliaments and palaces, to those who are huddled around radios in the forgotten corners of the world, our stories are singular, but our destiny is shared. And a new dawn of American leadership is at hand. Among the crowd watching Obama making history were media powerhouse Oprah Winfrey and political veteran Jesse Jackson. I was never the likeliest candidate for this office. We didn't start with much money or many endorsements. Our campaign was not hatched in the halls of Washington. 
It began in the backyards of Des Moines, in the living rooms of Concord, in the front porches of Charleston. During his speech, President-elect Obama told the story of 106-year-old Ann Nixon Cooper, born one generation past slavery, who had lived through the worst of times, but survived to see the best. This year, in this election, she touched her finger to a screen and cast her vote. Because after 106 years in America, through the best of times and the darkest of hours, she knows how America can change. Yes, we can. Obama has galvanized a country bitter and divided over economic woes, debilitating wars, and fractured dreams. Its people dearly hope that the next four years will see his promise fulfilled. This is our moment. This is our time to put our people back to work and open doors of opportunity for our kids, to restore prosperity and promote the cause of peace, to reclaim the American dream and reaffirm that fundamental truth that out of many we are one, that while we breathe we hope, and where we are met with cynicism and doubt and those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Thank you. God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America.